Okay, it's 7.30. It looks like we have 21 participants. I am Jennifer Larson, Chair of Programming for Friends of Chamber Music of Troy. And on behalf of Friends of Chamber Music, I would like to welcome you to our inaugural uh, performance in context. Friends of Chamber Music is embarking on its remarkable 72nd season. And we have a fall of virtual activities all of which are free to attenders. And we gladly welcome donations. These can be made directly um, from the Friends of Chamber Music website, which is www.friendsofchambermusic.org. Um, before we get going in earnest, I would like to introduce you to the president of Friends of Chamber Music, Julia Alsaraf. And should you have any technical problems, Julia will be on hand behind the scenes to assist you. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to pop in really quickly, say thank you for coming and welcome. Um, if you are having any Zoom related issues during this event, you can reach me by phone at 518-227-1742 um, or by private chat if you're familiar with that feature in Zoom. Um, I can Pull that up really quickly so you can see um, this chat button here. You can send a private message or you can email tech at friendsofchambermusic.org. I'll put all of that in the chat. Um, and without further ado, we'll just keep on going. Thank you, Julia. So um, I'd like to start with a little poll just to see how you all found out about this event. This will help us in deciding how to market in the future. Um, so if you'll take a moment to answer this question. How did you hear about this event? Word of mouth, social media. Did you hear it from the newspaper or the radio? Are you on our FOCM? Friends of Chamber Music email list or some other way. I'll give you a second to answer those. Okay. Okay, thank you for, for giving us that information. Um, we're here tonight to learn all about bows, violin bows, viola bows, cello bows. For something so small and that looks so fragile, breakable, these are amazingly expensive pieces of equipment and they're essential to professional players. Um, we have with us tonight Sawyer Thompson. He's a fine instrument dealer and a, with a specialty in bows and he can tell us why the right bow is essential to a great performer and what makes them so expensive um so welcome yeah thank you so much for having me yeah i'm going to start with um asking you how it was that you became interested in bows what is it that fascinates you about them well um i started playing cello uh when i was 10 and toward the end of high school, I was getting more serious and, you know, thinking that I would, um, you know, pursue it in college. Um, and so at that point, you know, I had been playing on a, a modern bow, which was, you know, perfectly good. Um, and they do represent, you know, good values. But the antique bows, they, they tend to have a um, more character, more um, complexity in the sound as well. Um, I should also add that I was a bit of a, a Harry Potter nerd growing up. Um, you know, and they, they do say the, the wand chooses the wizard, and I, I think it's very much the same with bows, um, not only just with the player, but also with the instrument as well. Um, it's, there's a chemistry, it's, it's, we can't really explain it, but, but some, if you play a bow on a certain instrument, it'll make it sound great, and on another one, it might mute it or, you know, make it sound terrible. Um, so there's really this magical connection um, that's frankly, you know, kind of hard to explain, but it's just there. Um, so that, that mystery was one of the things that really um, 
drew me to bows and I ended up um, during that first, you know, fine bow search, I, I found a, a James Tubbs bow. Um, at the time I had been playing a modern cello by a very fine maker, um, Lawrence Wilkie out of Connecticut. And, you know, modern instruments, they are great in so many ways and for so many things, you know, especially the cost. Um, but they, they do tend to lack a little bit of warmth and, and character. So I've often found that pairing an older instrument with a new bow, or excuse me, a new instrument with an old bow um, really adds, it, it's a good match and it, it really helps and makes, you know, a new instrument that might, you know, only be worth $30,000 sound, you know, add a zero to it or something like that. Uh -huh. So the bow has quite a lot of potential um, and is, yeah, as we said, crucially important um, to pair it. Oh. Um, so you're you're young for a fine instrument dealer. Um, can you tell us how you got into the business? Um, the business aspect? Well, I guess just I, being drawn to instruments started when I commissioned that cello from Lawrence Wilkie. He had three different models at the time, a Stradivari model, um, Montagnana, and the Thriller, which for cellos are the three main, um, you know, the three most desired models and you know I, I was at that point I started going down the rabbit hole of you know why does one model that's a little bit wider on the base or smaller you know how does that change the sound and I was just really fascinated by all of that um to the point that I was I mean I would just constantly look at um you know any photos I could find um you know auction pictures you know magazines strad magazine strings magazine um and I was just you know really amazed and yeah, again, you know, mystified at the fact that, you know, these instruments can be so old, you know, why do they sound so much better? And then, you know, you add on the, the price tag, the value of these things, and it's just, you know, really kind of extraordinary. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, I just, I looked at them a lot and I, I really loved them and I was just, you know, kind of a gearhead. Um, I, I find cellists tend to, uh, you know, they're always changing their strings, they're always, you know, end pins, tail pieces, you know, all sorts of things to adjust the sound. Um, and I was just really obsessed with all of that, you know, bows included. Um, I also do have a very good memory, um, not necessarily with names and other things, but with with photos and just seeing things, uh, especially bows and instruments. Um, I would, I hesitate to call it photographic, but it's it's very close to that. Um, you know, I can see an instrument or a, a bow and instantly, you know, tell you where I saw that before, what it is, you know, if it was at an auction, how much it sold for. Um, it's really just an obsession. Um, I didn't start taking private lessons until I was 14, which is a relatively late start. I started in a public school program. Um, so throughout that time, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's in my junior year of CIM, you know, I was, I was looking toward, you know, thinking about grad school at least and I, I knew that I had these two potential paths um, so the summer of my junior year I actually I wrote an email to the directors at JNA beer which is the largest um, you know their, their specialty is you know the fine old Italian instruments and I spent an entire summer there instead of going to a uh, chamber music festival which is very common for you know conservatory musicians um, so I spent the summer in London um, you know again just continuing to study and you know, at one point I had, you know, 16 Stradivari violins in one room, you know, I was just in the vault and that's how I spent a summer. Um, and at that point, you know, my love for that just grew more and more. And, you know, I continued to have, um, yeah, opportunities to view very um, fine things. And I just, you know, I, I ended up going that direction. And, you know, the unfortunate reality, it's always been the case, you know, it is, you know, a little bit easier to make a living um, selling these instruments than it is playing them, which is, you know, a shame, but um, that's just the, the reality of it, um, especially in today's times. I, uh, yeah, it's difficult. Um, so let's see, I wanted to start with talking about the bow, how a bow works, what it's made of, how does it pull the sound out of the string? Can you tell us a little about the construction of a bow and, and what makes it work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will actually at this point pull up my screen.
that should be shared now. Can you see that? Yep. Excellent. All righty. Um, so I'll just start with this bow. So this is the head of a bow. Um, without hair, I used that one just to illustrate some of the inner things. Let's use this one. So yeah, this is called the head. Um, this area over here, hopefully you can see my mouse. Um, that's the nose of a bow. Um, this is the frog. And inside of this, um, this adjuster, the silver cap at the end, it's, it's called the adjuster or the button. Um, you tighten that and it actually, it pulls the frog back, which brings tension to the hair. Um, So the hair is held with a wedge, actually, uh, which is inserted into this. It's called a mortise. Um, this bow, by the way, is a, a very fine Etienne Pajot. Um, he was working in 1840. Um, and yeah, so the bow, I mean, the wood that's used um, is called Pernambuco, uh, which is an exotic hardwood found um, in a very, it's a relatively small area of Brazil in the rainforest. Um, it was initially brought to France um, as part of the garment industry. Um, if you extract the color from the wood, if you, um, I'm not sure exactly what the process is, you know, you, you heat it in water and the color that's extracted is this very dark um, purple. Um, so initially it was used for the garment industry. Um, and yeah, so this guy up here, is Francois Xavier Tort, who is known as the Stradivari of the bow. Um, his working life was roughly 1775 to 1830. Um, and he was really experimenting, you know, with initially, um, and I don't have any photos here, but initially the bow, instead of being, um, you know, concave like this. It was initially convex the other way. Um, and the reason for that uh, repertoire at the time, um, there were a lot of chords being played and, and a certain instruments. It wasn't necessarily virtuosic. And so it didn't need as much tension on the bow. Um, later on in Tort's years, um, he was working with several prominent musicians at the time, Viotti among them. Um, he, yeah, he, he basically standardized the length of the bow um, up to 72 and a half centimeters. So they got longer, um, the shape changed, and that allowed for more tension and more aggressive playing as well. Um, yeah, I answered a little bit more there, but. <laughs> you, you did. I, so when they, when they talk about a strong bow or a flexible bow, or, a, or um, what, are they, what are they referring to? So it's really just, um, and it, it varies, you know, depending on the piece of wood that a maker has. So different woods have different strengths and densities to them. Um, you can actually measure the density of a bow by placing it in water. Um, and so some, you know, lesser sticks are known as floaters. So generally speaking, you want to have a, as dense a wood as possible. Um, which has become more and more difficult um, as years have gone on due to deforestation um, in Brazil. And there have been initiatives to um, replant these, this Pernambuco tree, but it takes a long time. And also interestingly, um, it seems that, you know, when this wood, when this, when these trees are farmed, they don't grow in necessarily the same way as in natural conditions, you know, having to fight to get to the top of a rainforest. Um, so the general consensus, at least among makers I'm in touch with, is that wood these days is not as good. And the best stuff, um, it seems to be long gong, which is, um, I guess, a difference between uh, bow making and violin making. There's still excellent quality maple and spruce, which are the main woods used for violin making that can be found. But uh, yeah, Pernambuco is very difficult to come by. And that... Um, it's reflected in actually some of the prices that these sticks trade for. Um, so yeah, the, to answer your question, um, a strong 
flexible bow, it, it, you want to have a ratio that's right in the middle of it. So if a bow is too stiff, it's going to, uh, it might have a good articulation, but the sound itself is not going to be allowed to, to vibrate with the instrument. Um, and also if it's too flexible, it doesn't give you the same amount of uh, power and articulation needed, you know, for the modern repertoire. So there's kind of this, you know, uh, ideal ratio that, you know, Tort and other great, you know, not just French, um, but, you know, other makers have come to. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so some of the bows, if you look at them on the end, are octagonal? Yes. And some are, I guess, oval or, or circular in cross section and some go from one to the other? So um, usually all bows um, at the handle are octagonal and that's so the frog is able to be fitted um, with, you know, the, the, the three facets at the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, they, they will, depending on this wood and the density, because weight is also a factor. So if a maker has a particular piece of wood um, and they determine that it's um, going to be a little too light, you know, they'll leave it octagonal because it, it does add, you know, perhaps two or three grams. Um, mm -hmm. And I should say the average weights of these bows uh, for a violin bow, the standard weight is around 60 grams, um, viola 70, cello 80. Uh, bass bows I don't deal with. Those can be anywhere from 120 to uh, yeah, 160. I, I call them baseball bats. Um, <laughs> so yes, uh, but generally speaking, you know, there's this conception. I don't, I'm not sure where it started. Um, a lot, I've run into a lot of players thinking that round bows are only the best ones. Um, I'm not sure if it was a teacher who started this, um, but actually, you know, a great many of the finest bows and the majority of golden period torts are all octagonal. Um, so yeah, they're, a good bow is a good bow, I like to say. Um, I know that, I know that the balance point is really important and these are, the balance points not always the same from one bow. Yeah, so it, it varies, um, sometimes widely. Um, the balance point is crucial for spiccato. Um, so that's the point at which when you're on the string, um, the bow will naturally bounce. Mm -hmm. um, and that can also be affected by uh, the winding that is on a bow. Um, Cause you can add or remove, you know, four to five grams just based on that. Um, but yes, um, balance point is very important. Some bows, um, they'll do spiccato and bounce in you know, a range of maybe five to six centimeters. Certain bows will only bounce in one particular spot. Um, so yeah, it's, it varies. Um, let's see. Um, I want to talk a little about camber, the things that you have to do to maintain a bow. Like, you know, these beautiful bows don't stay straight and they need to be rehaired also. And can you talk about yeah, the yeah, so when she refers to camber, um, you know, again, it's the, the arc of a bow. Um, sometimes bows will be left in a case, especially if they've been sitting for a while, um, and they'll be left with tension on the hair. And so over time, you know, if, if a bow sits like this under tension for too long, um, you know, it'll actually, some of the camber will be taken out of it just over time. Um, also with, uh, so not only up and down, but side to side, they can, you know, be quite, quite uh, warped. Um, and rehairs do have an effect on that. So when you're rehairing a bow, um, you have to, you know, usually I, I think a, a violin bow has four or five grams of hair, which might be, I don't know, 50 or 60 hairs in it. Um, if you have, you can adjust the knot to create tension on one side of the stick or another. And that's another um, factor in what bends a bow. So sometimes bows will be, you know, a little crooked intentionally um, from a rehair because some players like to have more tension on one side of the bow hair than another. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. I want to go right to the question about the value of bows. Can you tell us give us some ranges and um and tell us why some are more expensive than others yeah so 
value of bows um, for a, a student bow, like a um, just a you know advanced student, um, they can be anywhere from I'd say maybe a thousand dollars for a decent carbon fiber bow, um, so not even a wood bow, uh, to maybe two or three thousand for what would be called a workshop bow. Um, nowadays, many are made in Brazil. And when I say workshop bow, I'm, I'm, I mean that maybe one person, oh, sorry, there's a car horn. <laughs> um, maybe one person would uh, make the frog and other guys making buttons. Um, some person is roughing out the sticks. You know, it's, it's a collaborative effort and they're made very quickly. Um, so that's kind of the low end of bows. Uh, nowadays to get a good modern bow, um, you should plan to spend, you know, at least 4,000. Um, some modern makers, um, you know, there, there are many, many talented makers. We've definitely had a resurgence of great bow making, you know, probably since the late nineties and the same with violin making actually. Um, there are some makers who are even charging, you know, upwards of 15,000 for a brand new bow. Um, and while Roland comes to mind and some other French makers, um, yeah, and they're, they're very, very fine. Um, then you get into um, kind of the mid-tier uh, French bows, which you're really looking at, you know, around 1900 and possibly a little bit um, after that. Uh, so bows like Sartori, um, Voran, Lamy, and those can be anywhere from maybe 20 to 40,000. Um, yeah, and then you can get, you know, really crazy with stuff. So torts nowadays, um, the world record price at auction for a tort violin bow is close to seven hundred thousand ah. um, dollars, and this was uh, sold a couple years ago. And really, I mean, it was it was found in a Bordeaux flea market, <laughs> and it had been obviously un unplayed for you know two hundred years, um, just really a mint condition golden period tort, and it was it was found, and I. I uh, heard secondhand the person who found it um they, they had paid 150 euros for this bow and <laughs> yeah, so by the end of it yeah i think it was six hundred and eighty seven thousand oh, dollars wow. and so that was that was some you know collector who just had to have it well two collectors to to create a price like that at auction um but there are there have been torts that have sold for over a million and those are um usually ornate you know gold tortoiseshell bows or possibly, you know, with a, a famous provenance, um, you know, someone like Heifetz, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how many bows does a player usually have? Well, like um, a professional. yeah, so there are four slots, four bow slots in a violin case. Um, I'm, I, I see many violinists with three to four bows. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're a real enthusiast, you may have more. Um, or you might just have, you know, your your one good bow, and that's, uh, you know, your one and only. Mm -hmm. um, I find that more advanced players and general professional players, they they appreciate having different bows for different repertoire. Um, you know, if, if or for example, if they know they're going to be in an orchestra pit, they may not want to, uh, you know, use their finest bow if there's, you know, traffic around them and. Um, yeah, and so, you know, they might want a lighter bow for Mozart and Bach or a heavier bow for the romantic repertoire. Um, it really just depends. Uh, so when you go bow hunting, where do you hunt? <laughs> where, where, where are your hunting grounds? <laughs> where do I hunt? Um, so I do have a good, you know, relationship with various collectors, um, you know, also other colleagues as well who are actually, you know, dealers of these things. Um, I also regularly buy from auction. Um, just in general, my, my inventory is, you know, about half and half um, things that I have purchased and also things that are on consignment to me. Um, yeah, I mean, with some of these crazy expensive bows, it's just not possible to, you know, own everything. Um, but I, I do sell things, you know, on a commission basis as well. Um, yeah, and I, I'll go to all of the auctions in London, um, which are twice a year. Um, I also go to France. Um, yeah, sorry about this horn. <laughs> uh, yes. So, so what was your best find? Your most interesting find, or the yeah, the luckiest find? 
Um, I did find a tort um, and I did not pay a tort price for this tort. It wasn't a particularly, you know, extraordinary one. Um, the, the frog and button were later. Um, it was an earlier example. Um, but yes, I, I, I did find a tort at auction um, that, you know, no one else had seen. Um, so that's where the identification comes into play as well. Um, and bows are tricky because a lot of times you'll see a frog and button that have been made for a bow and that might cloud your impression when you're looking at it as a whole. You might automatically think, okay, well, the, the frog and button are by so-and-so, you know, therefore it must be. Um, so to, to separate, when, I, when I'm looking at a bow and hunting, as you call it, um, I'll, I'll look, I, I exclusively look at the head and I decide who made the head of this bow because the, the stick is obviously the most important. Um, if you don't have an original frog and button, a, a composite bow, um, that devalues it by approximately 30 to 40%. Um, it depends on the maker though. Some are more desirable that you just really want the stick, you know, regardless if it's original for the, for the frog and button. Um, so yeah, that's... Um, so, so for this tort, did you, did you know it was a tort? Were you sure? Or were you just kind of interested? You thought there was something interesting about it? I had a very good feeling. Um, it was, it was odd enough that it may have been mistaken for an English bow and I can actually, um, pull up my screen here again to show you photos of it. Yeah. So this was the, the bow. Um, and this is a violin bow, but interestingly, um, it has a rather elongated head. Um, very elegant, sweeping uh, kind of figure to it. Um, so yeah, this was circa 1785. And, you know, based on the, the dark color of the wood, um, you know, a lot of people could have looked at this bow and thought, you know, it was a, an English bow, which the frog and button on this bow, um, gold mounted, uh, they, they are English. They, they're made by James Tubbs. Um, so again, like you could look at that frog and button and, you know, you could look at the head and they do, you know, they, they work stylistically. Um, so yeah, I mean, I had a good feeling about it. This is a feature that I really have to pay attention to when I'm looking at bows and comparing. So this is the handle mortise. Um, generally speaking, the French guys, uh, French bow makers, they're rather wide here. Um, some German makers, they're, they're quite a bit more narrow. Um, I noticed on your on your um, photos that you have one that shows how you authenticate um, some bows, where you can see the number underneath the hair. Oh yeah, so that's with um, yeah. hill bows. Um, show you a photo. This is a, a hill bow. So up here we have this the silver. They're they're both tortoise shell actually. Um, this top one is. They're both early hills, but the top one is circa 1905, uh, made by Sidney Yeoman. Um, and the bottom one is an Arthur Barnes viola bow. Um, the hill shop was very prolific. They made many, many, many bows in London. Um, I think in the 80s, one of the former makers revealed that they had a system for actually identifying them, um, which I'm pulling up here. And so this is on the head plate. And you can see that there's a number five. Um, so that particular maker, and you can even, you know, you can Google the list because since it was published. Um, that's uh, Arthur Barnes. Um, this other one, which is quite a bit more difficult to see, um, is a very, very small nick, um, like a little tiny point. And that was in the center of the bow. And that is a yeoman. Uh, that was his mark. Um, yeah, and the hill bows, I mean, they had varying grades. So these, if they had the full brand W.E. Hill and Sons, that was their top of the line making. Um, this is another hill, which is shortened. Um, and it's just a W.E. H and S. 
So they had varying grades at varying you know, price points. However, um, the stick quality, the wood quality, even for the lower grade bows was quite fine. Uh, this is another shot of that yeoman. And you can see this, this figure in the Pernambuco um, flames, as I call it. Uh, it's really just quite beautiful. And yeah, I mean, very, very elegant. It's, they're, they're really pieces of, pieces of art. Would, would you show us some of the frogs? I see you have some that are ivory and some there that are yeah. materials. So this is an example of what would be called a transitional kind of bow. Um, this was made by uh, Jean-Marie Persois. Um, this is circa 1805, and he had trained in the tort workshop. Um, so if you notice here, there's actually no uh, ferrule. The hair is just um, loose. So the, the, the sensation that that gives the player um, it's not quite as immediate, the attack. Um, but again, so very good for chords. Sorry? Um, transitional, you mean from Baroque to modern, is that right? Yes, yes. Um, you see this has this ivory inlay built into the stick. Um, it's a very narrow uh, frog. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly the best shot to illustrate that. Um, the head of that bow. Um, some others, here's another ivory. And this, this is quite a, I call this a bling bow. Um, it has engraved gold. This is a Bernard Huchard for Vidudez, uh, Switzerland. Um, That's beautiful. Yeah, really, really fine workmanship. So head. I had heard that people have trouble traveling when they have, um, bows that have certain materials in them. How, what do you do if you have a, a bow that has a tortoise shell or, or that has ivory that dates like that? Do you remove the frog and substitute another one that allows you to travel? What are That's, people doing? That is common. Um, I think recent, and it, it's difficult to stay up to date on all of this because it is changing, but re the recent CITES, um, I'm not even sure what that stands for actually, but ladies, they, they have a, a determination of what percentage weight-wise an item has. So like, for example, I think with, um, I think they set it at 200 grams is the max. And that, that's kind of like um, for piano keys is how they, they based that off of, you know, with the idea of importing pianos. Um, with bows though, I, I think it's a percentage base. Um, so at the moment, and don't quote me on this because it is changing, um, I understand that violins and bows, or, um, you know, violins with like rose board fingerboards um, and bows that have ivory and tortoise shell are actually okay to travel with, as long as you have a certificate, you know, declaring that they're past a certain age. Um, yeah, modern stuff, you know, most modern makers nowadays, they're not even making tortoise shell bows, just purely for the hassle. Um, there was a period where these, you know, ivory tips, um, you know, like on this bow, it has the original so that, that would be elephant ivory. Um, there was a period where that was uh, a point of concern. Nowadays, most makers are using mastodon. Um, you know, they're, they're harvesting from uh, Siberia. Um, but it is very, very difficult to actually tell them apart. So there's always some risk when traveling and crossing borders with bows. So, so when you, when you uh, acquire these bows, who are you selling them to, and how do you how do you um, find the right buyer, and how do they identify the perfect one? It's a bunch of questions, but um. yeah. Um, so I really started out, you know, just working with musicians, um, you know, conservative conservatory musicians, orchestra players. Um, yeah, I mean, there there are some bows even that are called you know players bows which again might be, you know, have a lesser value due to a later frog and button or maybe a little bit of damage to a bow. Um, sometimes, you know, if a bow completely breaks, um, then it's a total devaluation. If, if a bow snaps at the head, it will, you know, they can play close to the same, but they're never actually the same. And in the eyes of a collector, that's a, that's a total devaluation. Cause once it, once it breaks, you know, around this portion, um, that's kind of the end of it in terms of its value. So 
that's how I started, um, not selling broken bows, but, you know, mid-range bows to conservatory players. Um, I have, you know, recently gotten more into selling to collectors um, and, you know, how I determine what to offer, you know, a specific person, you know, with, with collectors, their, their main priority is quality of example and also condition of the bow. Um, I have a couple bows that have, you know, like the original hair in them from 1930, which are just wow. untouched. Um, and that's the kind of thing that collectors will really, you know, salivate over and, you know, desire um, the, the uniqueness of them. Um, yeah, I mean, I have an international clientele. Uh, this past summer, I was in Korea um, for actually, yeah, pretty much the whole summer. Um, and just, you know, yeah, using a network and Working your network. Yeah. Um, I'm going to call Julia back now. Uh, we're going to move to the Q&A section. And I notice we have a number of questions in both the Q&A and the chat. You can, you can probably see those, but here's Julia. Yes. Hi again, everyone. Um, if you are familiar with Zoom, um, we will be using the Q&A functionality. Um, so I can pull that up for you. So there's a button here that says Q&A that you can use to enter a question if you'd like to type a question. If you would like to, um, to speak and to have your question uh, to say it aloud, then what you can do is you can raise your hand um, and I can push a, a button here that will allow you to talk. So um, feel free to do whichever your preference is. Julia, how do they raise their hand? Oh, um, there is a button at the, depending on which device you're using, um, it should be down at the bottom on a phone in particular. I think it's one of two buttons that you have access to. My screen looks different because uh, I'm a panelist, so um, yours may look slightly different. Okay, so Sawyer, so you can see the Q and A's. Can, do you want to read them and answer them or shall I yes. move them up? There are also about seven in the chat. Okay. Um, cool. So one of the questions, historically, what other woods have been used? Why is Pernambuco best? Um, there are several other woods, um, uh, like Amaret is one, snake wood, um, iron wood, many, many different types. Um, and they're actually, depending on the specific type of wood, it's, it's from different sections of the tree. Pernambuco is usually from the, the heartwood, um, the very center of the uh, tree. Um, and that's, it just has the best density. So for example, um, woods like ironwood or amaret, they tend to be more flexible, um, which for, you know, for some bows can be a good thing, but usually they'll end up being heavier um, or lighter. Um, yeah, the, the, the tone quality is never quite as good as Pernambuco. Um, it's really unique. And also it's, it's the most, you know, aesthetically beautiful as well. Um, how can you tell from just the stick who made it if it's not signed? Right, so that's where, um, you know, the identification and the memory comes into play because some makers, you know, were inconsistent. Um, some signed their, their bows for a certain period then stopped um, others would supply bows for other shops that would be, you know, stamped with their own, um, the shop name as opposed to the maker's name. So for example, oh, I need to share the screen here again. Uh, photos. Right. So Here is a bow. Um, it's stamped Caressa in Francais, Paris. Um, you asked about the stick first, so I'll go with that. Uh, this bow is made by Jules Fatigue. Um, the head, the lines. So, so when I look at this bow, the, the first thing I think about is just, you know, strictly as a two dimensional object. Um, you know, does, does the silhouette work? 
uh, or who, who does the silhouette remind me of? And in this case, my first thought might be, you know, it's uh, a lot of Sartori influence in this. Um, you notice here, and Jennifer, can you see my mouse all right? Yes, I can. Excellent. Okay, so here, um, this is called a chamfer, this cut going down the rid or going down the uh, side of the stick. So right here, um, the chamfer is quite wide and it gets progressively thinner and quite thin. And that, um, the rate at which it gets thinner is very, very even, you know, once it's about here. It's very, uh, yeah, consistent. Um, but truly, I mean, I'll, I'll look at that head and already I'm in that mindset. I'm like, okay, this is either a Sartori or really a Jules Fatigue. Um, and Jules Fatigue worked for Sartori. Um, so this time period, Sartori was making bows from 1892 to um, about 1945. And Jules Fatigue was employed by him around 1925, I believe. Um, and then we go to the frog of that same bow. One of the characteristics of Jules Fatigue um, as opposed to a closed throat. This area right here is called the throat of a frog. Um, one of the characteristics for Jules is that it's slightly open. Imagine kind of an open mouth. Um, the eye placement, uh, the button work. So anyways, that, that's a bow that was made for another firm. Um, and here, I have another one. Um, and it's slightly different lighting, but again, you have this width here, gets narrower. But again, the basic outline is very much the same, despite the fact that this one is round, and the other is octagonal. Um, and again, a black background makes it a little more difficult, but it has that same open throat to it, same eye placement. Um, this one has its own brand, which is qu quite rare. Um, this is a particularly crisp example. Um, you can even see when he had a little bit of difficulty with the branding iron and you can see that it's almost a double stamp. So it's, it's a, a brand that's placed again, very small. And if there's any wiggle room, it has the effect of almost being stamped twice. Um, many makers and violin makers as well, they'll, they'll tell you that, you know, stamping a bridge or stamping a, a bow is, you know, one of the most difficult things. Um, for makers that did not brand their bows. You know, it's kind of the same, the same idea. Um, going to this Pajot, this is a golden period, Etienne Pajot. I mean, I just, I look at that head, you notice that it's fuller throughout here. Um, super, super clean and rather consistent chamfers. Um, and the, again, the, the proportions, you know, I, I'm looking at each one of these things basically like it's a sculpture. Um, and just, you know, you start to recognize, you know, the hands of specific makers. Um, if you want to get a little more into the, the techie stuff of, uh, you know, what I'm looking for when I'm looking at old bows, um, I, I chose this Pajot because it's a very, very fresh example, you know, with original head plate. Um, one feature here. If you look at the nose, you, you can tell by the, the lamp spot that it's flat. Um, some makers will keep a ridge down the bow, you know, quite consistently um, going back to this tort. Um, this line carries all the way down. And actually with tort, um, this is rather interesting. He, he was very consistent in having this ridge deviate to the um, player's side of the head. So it, it's going down and kind of this, you know, to the side S, which is, you really want to see that on tort. Um, if you just track that light there. So that's just one factor. Uh, back to the Pajot. Um, so you're then with the stick, I'm looking at the mortise shape. So this mortise is quite, um, I hesitate to say square, but it, it's the, the lines, are rather squarish. It's a little stubby um, compared to something like this Voran, um, which you know has a little bit more flare out to the sides. Um, and this is also an original head plate. Um, makers will pin heads differently. So this one has two pins there and there. Um, 
one of the features of Pajo, different makers will cut their chamfers in different ways. The chamfer really is one of the areas of bow making that allows a maker to have the most um, artistic freedom and creativity. Um, and they have also used different tools to cut them. So Pajo always used a knife. Um, and, you know, it, it's not the most smooth cut. If we really zoom in here, you can see these vertical lines, which are actually knife marks. Um, however, the edge of the chamfer where it meets this area is just razor sharp. And that's only able to be achieved by using a knife. Um, whereas, oh, here are the chamfers. This is another Pajot chamfer with a knife. You know, you can see it's a little irregular going down, but it's still very, very sharp. And so that was literally just used one cut, boom, just down the side of the head. And you know, what it was, it was. They, they weren't too terribly concerned about it. You know, they were making bows. They were, um, you know, for really this was just a way to make a living. You know, back then these guys were not appreciated really at all, which is extraordinary. Um, there was a time where, you know, if you would walk into a violin shop and, and buy a, maybe what nowadays is a 20 or $30,000 violin, they would have said, oh, well, reach into this umbrella stand over here and just pick a bow. And, you know, there are stories that there were actually sartoris, you know, just in this umbrella stand. And now, you know, the, the bow is worth more than the violin. So that's just a, a cultural change, I guess, and, and recognition of just how important bows are. Um, yeah, people are starting to realize just how big of a difference they make and they're, they're no longer viewed as accessories um, like they once were. But anyways. So, so yeah, I, I looked down the questions in the chat box mm -hmm. uh, and there were a couple I thought were kind of interesting. One yes. was, um, are there non-wood materials used in constructing bows and how, did, how are they? Um, yeah, so there's carbon fiber nowadays. Um, which playability wise, it's, it's pretty okay. Um, sound though, it, it doesn't have a warm sound to it. Um, and it, I mean, just also the, the, the feel, it doesn't have the same kind of sensual connection to the strings. You, you feel like you're holding an object, whereas with a really great, you know, torch or um, just a great older bow, you really feel like you're not even holding anything. You're just connected to the strain um, or to the instrument, I should say. And I found personally that, you know, carbon fiber bows lack that. And my, my first bow was, you know, a Coda bow, I think at the time, 500 bucks or something. And it, it got me through, you know, Suzuki book four or five or whatever it was. But um, yeah, there's also, so the other, oh, oh, cool. there's also what, I was going to say, um, people are now experimenting with bamboo because um, something that we're running into a lot is uh, these super cheap fiberglass bows. They're not even carbon fiber, but fiberglass. You know, these are 40 or $50 bows. Um, and if you want to change the hair on them, you know, it costs more money to get a rehair than it does just to buy a new bow. So there's actually a lot of um, waste that's been occurring. Um, just across the board with these bows being thrown away. So people are experimenting with bamboo because it's a very cheap material. Um, it can also be, you know, manufactured in a, in a quick way, um, but we'll see where that goes. So the, there was another question um, from the chat box. Uh, do all really good players play really good bows? And then, and then, and then added to the question was, I bet not. <laughs> This is true. Um, some players will have a Strad violin, you know, a $10 million violin and be perfectly content with, uh, you know, $5,000 bow or a broken bow. Um, other players, you know, will have a just kind of a okay violin and have an extraordinary bow. Um, interestingly, it seems that for the top tier players, you know, the, the real soloists and competition winners, you know, principal musicians of orchestras. Um, it's getting more and more difficult to, to be able to afford a great, truly first class violin. 
something like a Guadagnini, um, you know, Strads and Del Jesus, you can just forget about that nowadays because for a good one, anyone that you would want, you're looking at probably, you know, $10 million. Um, so what we're seeing actually is more and more players, instead of owning a, a great old Italian violin, they're, you know, owning a modern instrument being loaned a antique, you know, super expensive one, either by their orchestra or, you know, a foundation, and then choosing to take that money that they would have spent on a first tier violin and instead putting it into a bow, like a, you know, a great picot or a tort. Um, you know, relatively speaking, bows are still, in my opinion, wildly undervalued, um, which is why I'm also, you know, specializing in them. I think there's more room to grow there. Um, and also it's just, you know, I like being able to deal in things that, you know, regular musicians can actually afford. So, mm -hmm. yeah. It looks like we have three more in the Q and A. Okay. Um, oh, do you know anything about Paul Nor bows? K -N -O -R -R. So, Paul Nor. Um, I actually don't. I, I know that he was a well-known violin maker, uh, Mark Nurkirkin. Um, I would like to see photos of it because something that was very common, especially in Germany. Um, were again, like, like in France, bows being made and then, you know, supplied for shops, makers and being, you know, branded with the, the shop's brand. So off the top of my head, I would be inclined to think that it's a bow. It's probably a Mark Nekirken bow that Paul Noor sold. I don't know him to be a bow maker, but I would love to uh, see it anyways and just uh, comment. Um, yeah, he was a fantastic violin maker. I mean, he might be the most highly valued uh, Mark Nickirk and violin maker. So, um, there were two questions about the horsehair that is used on the bows. Well, where does it come from? Yeah, so the the best horsehair comes from Mongolia. Um, yeah, and as of late, it's been more and more difficult to get top quality bow hair, um, and I hear this from. Uh, bow makers and restorers who do rehairs and also players and also just in my own experience, you know, as I've been playing. Um, one thing that people, uh, I get asked a lot about actually is, you know, do they have to kill the horses for the hair? Um, sometimes yes, you know, if it's just a, a byproduct afterwards, but actually if you, you are able just to, you know, cut the horse hair and it, you know, comes back. Um, but the the quality of the hair absolutely matters. Um, you don't want a hair that is too, um, too coarse because then you'll get this grainy white noise in the sound, kind of a shh, you know, a hissing sound, um, which is most noticeable under your ear, but still very annoying. Um, and vice versa, if, if your hair is too fine, it doesn't have enough grip and articulation. And one side note I should say about all of this, um, for any players, you know, who get a rehair, um, new hair put in the bow. You know, it's amazing. You, you could have a, a $10 million violin with a half million dollar tort, the best hair ever, but without the rosin, the $10 cake of rosin, none of it makes a sound, which is really, you know, quite amazing. And that's the sap um, that sticks because on a very small detailed level, these horse hairs have individual barbs. Um, and then when you put the rosin onto them, it, it sticks and that's what allows it to grip the string. So yeah, without rosin, there's no sound at all, which is kind of amazing. It is amazing. Uh, and the rosin itself does make a huge difference as well. Um, I know players will uh, occasionally have some rosin, you know, or one rosin for uh, summer climate, another for winter, because um, it does tend to get, you know, kind of sticky. Um, and if you leave it in a hot car, it'll melt. So. <laughs> So um, somebody asks, what do you know about German bows? German bows. Um, I love German bows. They are incredibly undervalued and, and much like German violins, they have a bit of a, um, they're not as recognized or appreciated just because they've kind of been associated with the, the mass produced things. Um, you know, there were literally millions upon millions of German violins and bows made that are of terrible quality. Um, but there were some really fine craftsmen making as well. 
Um, in the German bows, they go back, you know, around the same time as tort, actually, like 1820, um, some of the earliest knopfs. Um, I do have some photos. Oh, I need to do the screen share again, sorry. Okay. Um, so here we have a Johann Wilhelm Knopf. Um, this would have been circa 1860 or 70. And he was working off of a tort model um, and was making you know, some very fine bows here. And it's not quite in focus, so I apologize for that. But what I'm painting this, so the one um, farthest away is, a, is the Johann Wilhelm. Um, this one here closest is a tort. And one of the key uh, features of torts making, especially on his octagonal bows, um, is the way this facet is finished into the, the head of the bow. And so you see it, it's not straight, it's not an exact line. It, it has almost like a, a samurai sword kind of effect to it if you're looking at this light. So that particular finishing, um, you know, this German guy did exceptionally well. Um, I actually, I sold two of those in the last two weeks um, to very fine players who have other bows. Um, and they just, you know, they remark that they're for the, for the money, you know, these are approximately $15,000 bows, these Johann Wilhelm Knopfs. Um, they will absolutely meet and, you know, even exceed, you know, French bows up to around 40 or $50,000. Um, another one of my favorite makers is Carl Albert Nurnberger, uh, who's from a family of, there were five Nurnbergers, um, Franz one, two, Carl Albert, Carl with a K, I'm forgetting the most recent guy, but Carl with a C is the one who's most talented. Um, this particular bow has a Stanhope lens in it, and I don't have a photo here, but if you hold your eye up to that, um, there's actually an image of Nurnberger making a bow. Um, <laughs> and it's called a micro lens, which is pretty cool. Um, this is the head of that bow. Just very fine, clean work. Um, again, the Nurnberger. To be able to make, so when, when they're, well, for an octagonal bow, they only use a plane. So they are taking a plane and running it down the entire length of the stick. Um, some bow makers, if you look down the stick, you will get absolutely dizzy trying to, to follow it. Um, whereas you, if you look at this bow, um, it's just extraordinarily straight, clean lines. And when you're working, um, you know, on something as small as a bow, you know, you're talking about less than a centimeter thickness, eight sides of an octagon to make it even, and you know, proportional as it goes down the stick, it, it's not easy to do. Um, making an octagonal bow is actually much more difficult than making a rounded bow because, you know, a rounded bow you get it to that point and then you just kind of sand it all over. Um, yeah, that's so beautiful. I, yeah. So there was a question about the grain. Uh, the question is, the bows all have beautiful grain. Does the grain make a difference in the quality of the sound? Mm, I would say no. Um, good wood is good wood. Uh, this bow here is an extremely fine um, Nicholas Mare, and this is circa 1850. So if you're looking at this wood, I mean, it, I, I look at this and I can see that it has very deep, um, it's, uh, the quality of the wood is excellent. It's, it's dark. I can just tell from looking at that photo that it's going to be very dense. I don't have many, there aren't many pores. It's, um, let's see. It's just very tight grain. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it's not super flamed, right? Um, like something like this hill, for example. You know, I, I call these candy cane bows. And they are just tremendously beautiful to look at. Mm -hmm. um, does it actually affect the sound? I don't think so. 
Um, but it is likely that if a bow has that kind of figure in it, that it's going to be of better quality. Um, you know, like this, this Jules Fatigue, it's kind of the same situation as that mare. It's relatively plain, but it's super dense, um, super fine. So. So there's a question about um, all four string instruments. Do mm -hmm. they do they almost all use French or? Well, let's see. Let me find the question again. I'll read it. <laughs> uh, can all four stringed instruments use German or French bows? Yes. Yes. Um, so, so let's say you you play um, you play a viola. Would you prefer a German bow or a French bow? versus a violinist or a cellist or um, references? I mean, if, if money's no object, you'll always go for the greatest, you know, school of French making, you know, Tort, Picot, um, Persois, Sartori. Um, but really though, I mean, there are some just fantastic German bows that um, will best them. You know, no, because each stick is unique and different, you know, no two bows play alike. So, I, I would say, you know, the best Nuremberger is probably quite a bit better than, you know, the worst tort. You know, there, there is overlap, certainly. So it's, it's really a case by case. And then again, you know, with your instrument, you know, you, you may have a particularly bright cello that requires a darker English sounding bow, or, you know, maybe you have a, a husky violin that needs, you know, something to liven it up. So I noticed that it is 831. We could go on and on. Um, but I want to thank you all for attending tonight. Um, I hope that you will be able to join us in October when we host the Tesla Quartet for our next uh, performance in context talk. And then we will have uh, a virtual concert with them and a virtual and a, another Q&A with them. So there'll be three Tesla events. Um, Julia will come back in a moment and enable a final survey. I really hope you will give us a bit of feedback about what your takeaway is from this. And I really want to thank Sawyer for giving us so generously of his knowledge and his time. I, I learned a lot and I hope you all did too. Thank you so, so thank much. You. Thank you for having thank me. You. And, well, and we're going to end the recording. Um, and then if people would like to stick around and just share any additional feedback, you're welcome to do that. Um, Trying to remember if there was anything else. Yes, the survey should pop up in your browser after you end, after you exit the meeting. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you. Thank you.